Good afternoon. Welcome to the November 8, 2018 meeting of the City County Planning Board. Would you please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on TV 13. It will be rebroadcast at 10 a.m. Friday morning and again at 4 p.m. Sunday afternoon. Our first order of business today is the consent agenda. These are items for which the petitioner is requesting withdrawal or continuance, or items for which staff has recommended approval and no one has signed up to speak in opposition. For public hearings today, each side has a total of 12 minutes. There is no rebuttal period. Once the public hearing is closed, the board goes into work session. No one will be permitted to speak unless a planning board member asks a question. For general use district zoning, the board must consider the full range of uses allowed in the district. Therefore, you may not refer to specific use. For special use district zoning, however, you must be very specific about how the site will be developed and the intended uses. Items under Section B of the agenda require final approval either by the City Council or County Commissioners. As such, votes taken today will go to those bodies for their consideration. If you are addressing the board today, before you begin your remarks, please give us your name, address, and zip code for the record. First item of business approval, we have two sets of minutes, two meetings on October 25th. Any additions or corrections to either of those? There's one correction. Okay. Um, for the work session, for <coughs> item three, mm -hmm. I was not here. Okay. And it's showing that I voted for it. Okay. You got that. Any other corrections? But that one change is a motion to approve. Motion, Mr. Lamb. Second. Second, Mr. Lee. Can we have discussion? <coughs> Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Now call on uh, Mr. Roberts to present our consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, first item on the consent agenda is B1. It's a proposed general use rezoning from, excuse me, special use limited rezoning from general industrial to general business special use limited. It's located in the Stratford Industrial Park, um, just east of Stratford Road and south of Kimmel. Uh, it's surrounded by GI zoning. Um, the area plan does recommend industrial on the property. Uh, planning staff talked about this case, and there is some overlap between the existing GI and the proposed GB zoning. Um, they have really requested only uses that are currently allowed in the GI district with about half a dozen other uses, which are not your typical uh, convenience need type retail uses. Uh, staff is comfortable with this request um, because of the scale and location of the site. We don't think it will lead to strip commercial development. Uh, we would be concerned about widespread retail rezoning in this area, but we don't really, really see these uses as being uh, too inconsistent with it, what the uh, surrounding uses uh, allow So on the GI zoning. So staff recommends approval. Is anyone here opposed to this recommendation? Said no one. I'll declare the public hearing closed. Move approval. Second. Motion, Mr. Lamb. Second, Mr. Groves. Any discussion? Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is B2, zoning docket W3389. Uh, this is a proposed rezoning from a combination of limited industrial, general industrial, and general business special use to the E District, entertainment district. It's located uh, west of Highway 52 and uh, north of Liberty Street and 10th Street. It's kind of a, a northeastern extension of downtown where some recent uh, reinvestment and redevelopment significant amounts have taken place and some other EL and E zonings uh, have taken place also recently. Uh, so we really see this as an extension of this area. Uh, the industrial <coughs> district has served this area well, uh, but there's approximately 300,000 square feet of unused uh, space that are that is on this property, so we really feel like this district, which does allow manufacturing, A, it does allow for some industrial uses, also residential uses in retail and service and larger entertainment venues, uh, is consistent with Legacy, which recommends an extension of entertainment opportunities on the north side of downtown. So uh, staff has supported this request, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions, staff? Yes, sir. Um, were all the, uh, is all of this owned by the petitioner? Yes. Okay. 
Every everything's owned by the petitioner, so there's no other property owners within that yellow <coughs> mark. That's correct. Okay. I had a question. Um, yes. Which of these roads are growth corridors? Patterson. Patterson mm -hmm. and is Northwest as well or? I do not believe so. No, Northwest is not a growth corridor. It's probably a major, a, a minor thoroughfare just, collector street. Just Patterson. Just, just Patterson. Just Patterson. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, that, and that's another reason this area is well served with transit and sidewalks and it's on a growth corridor. Staff has recommended approval. Is anyone here opposed to this recommendation? Said none. Now, to the public hearing closed. Your approval. Second. Mr. Mr. Lamb, second by Mr. Leake. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is B4. Uh, this is a rezoning on Wahlberg Road. It's uh, a little over 92 acres of undeveloped property. The proposal is from agricultural to limited industrial special use. Uh, this case has been requested for a continuance to your December 13th meeting. Uh, because we received that prior to the Monday deadline, this is an automatic continuance to your December 13th meeting. Next item is B5. Uh, this is a final development plan for property zoned uh, highway business special use. It's just south of Haynes, Ma Haynes Mill Boulevard, um, off, of, off of Summit Square Boulevard. The property is undeveloped, and the proposed use is an approved use, motor vehicle, uh, motor vehicle maintenance and repair. And this is a proposed site plan. Uh, I think it's a three-bay facility there uh, with two access points, or excuse me, one access point, and um, proposed stormwater directly south of the building and tree save below that. The area plan uh, recommends commercial for the property, and staff recommends approval of the site plan. Anyone here opposed this recommendation? So none. I'll try to public hearing closed. Move approval. Second. Motion Mr. Lamb, second by Mr. Grubbs. Any discussion? Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is B6. Uh, this is agenda item 3391, zoning case 3391. This is a proposed rezoning on the corner of Ricks Drive and Thurston Street, just uh, northwest of Stratford Road. Uh, proposed rezoning from LB, excuse me, PB, pedestrian business, to LB uh, limited business for the use of kennel and door. Um, the petitioner has requested a continuance to the December 13th meeting. Uh, we just received that yesterday, so the request is not automatic, and you will need to vote on this request to continue it to December 13th. Okay. Is there anyone in the audience that is opposed to continuing this? Okay, then what's the wishes of the board? That we continue to 12th, 13th. Motion by Mr. Lamb, second. Mr. Bryan, uh, to continue for one month. Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is C1, a preliminary subdivision approval for an eight-lot subdivision uh, located on the south side of Clemens Road. It's case number 2018-108. Uh, again, this is an eight-lot subdivision. It's zoned RS9, located adjacent to the eastern side of the IP zoning for Tanglewood Park, and it abuts up to Clemens uh, single-family zoning on the east. Uh, this is a site plan here showing the subject property. There was no real... Uh, opportunity for connectivity to adjacent properties considering the development pattern. Um, again, an eight-lot single-family subdivision, and it meets ordinance requirements, and planning staff recommends approval. No approval. Second. Motion, Mr. Lamb, second, but Mr. Leake. Any discussion? Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is D1, uh, planning board review for planning board uh, planning Plan residential development, single family subdivision. This is actually a 116 lot uh, plan residential development located on the southeastern side of Fishel Road, south of Leak Creek, and east of Peters Creek Parkway. As you can see, the property is currently undeveloped. Uh, this is a site plan showing the subject property there. Uh, you received in your packet 117 lots once they uh, made some adjustment for a lot that was in a utility easement. It dropped down to 116. Uh, lots. Uh, it exceeds the connectivity ratio, has uh, good internal connectivity with no cul-de-sacs and two stubs to adjacent properties. Uh, it is a PRD, which means in exchange for having no minimum lot size, they have to have open space, at least 15 percent of the development in open space, divided amongst three types. So they've got a 50-foot wide uh, thoroughfare op open space area along Fishel Road. Uh, they've got a 30-foot wide buffer around the, along the perimeter. That's their passive open space. 
And in the green shown, that's their park in the center, that's their active open space. Uh, so they've the line that really is a central area. As you drive in, you see that focal point. Uh, they did adjust the lighting pattern at staff's request to open that up a little bit. And uh, so the plan does meet ordinance requirements, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Staff recommends approval. Move approval. Second. Second. Motion by Mr. Lamb. Second, Mr. Leak. Any discussion? Those in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> First public hearing item is F1582. Petitioners Tyler Lineback and Todd Lineback. Uh, for 3.17 acres located on the southeast side of Everett Road, north of Evans Road. Uh, the request is a special use limited no site plan rezoning from RS9 to GBL general business special use for the single use of storage services retail. This is Legacy's growth management plan located in the south central portion of the county in growth management area 3. And this is an aerial photograph showing the subject property. It's, again, in a suburban location. Um, once you get south of Ebert Road, it's intersection with Clemens Road. There's not much commercial development in this area. Pretty low-density residential. Uh, and this is a zoning map showing the subject property. It's triangular in shape and currently undeveloped, uh, a little over three acres in size. Um, just to the northeast, you can see the commercial zoning and institutional zoning in there. That's within an area plan uh, recommendation for an activity center. Uh, and actually, there's about six and a half additional acres in the activity center where um, commercial zoning is recommended. So uh, this is a little bit south of that. The next image here is the, the uh, area plan, the south uh, suburban area plan, 2017, just adopted a year ago. And um, if, if you look closely at the other map, you can see this is kind of a squaring off of the red area of the activity center. Again, about six and a half acres of property it recommends for expansion of that uh, activity center, but not into this area, which we really feel like would kind of pull energy away from that activity center and begin a strict commercial development uh, pattern. Across the street is recommended for, um, for moderate density residential, and obviously the subject property is recommended to remain the same single-family residential. Uh, these images are taken on site. This is looking north on Ebert. Uh, the subject property is to the right. There in the background on the left is uh, this facility here. This is a non-conforming auto repair and sales operation. This property is recommended to go to commercial. And this is looking south on Ebert Road from the subject property and then across Ebert Road. Uh, taking a little bit of a broader look, as we mentioned in the staff report, in addition to uh, pulling energy away from this, this uh, activity center that's recommended, um, staff has some concerns about transportation to the two new schools, uh, the Kimmel Farm Elementary and the Flat Rock Middle Schools, which are located further down um, Everett Road, shown there in the blue on the left, and a future high school site uh, really need, obviously, good, safe access to and from those facilities which were just invested, just uh, developed there. So uh, we feel like that this could set a pattern for other commercial intense development, you know, events, uh, excuse me, uh, intense developments that could impact traffic to those schools. So that's another reason why staff is concerned with this, this request. And also if you'll note in the upper left, the, uh, the purple, that's industrial area that's recommended for industrial use and the limited industrial district does allow for um, this use of storage services retail. So that's even more reason why not to go against the area plan um, for this site. In analysis, the request is not consistent with a low density residential land use recommendation of the area plan. Uh, new commercial investment in the area is recommended for the activity center and not mid block along Everett Road. Uh, it would encourage other strip commercial rezonings along this portion of Everett Road. Uh, and it would be detrimental to the long-term transportation impacts uh, regarding access to the existing and future schools located further south on Everett Road. Uh, and just in summary, again, the area plan was just adopted in 2017, and staff really sees no changing conditions that would warrant uh, this rezoning. So staff's recommendation is for denial, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions of staff at this time? Mm -hmm. Is your concern about transportation as it relates to the schools, just the number of trips projected to be generated by this? Primarily, yes. 
this and the and the future impact, you know, if it leads to future strip development coming south down Ebert Road, the trips that could be generated from that kind of jamming up that roadway, that's that's definitely a concern of staffs. This is a public hearing. Uh, Mr. Lineback. Sir, yeah. I stand here? No, no, come okay. come down here, please. <coughs> All right. Can everybody hear me fine? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming tonight and, uh, you know, allowing us to ask for the rezoning. Please, so, excuse me. We need your name and address. Tyler Lineback at uh, 6130 Stadium Drive, Clemens, NC 27012. Thank you. So um, I guess a little bit about the property itself, uh, like I said, is, you know, triangular. So we're only looking to develop the first half of it. Um, Without a topography of it, it's kind of hard to describe, but there's basically a smaller triangle within the larger triangle. We don't anticipate developing all 3.17 acres at once. Um, the beauty of what we're looking to do is not erect any permanent buildings. So that the common storage building company would erect a large brick building and go about that way. We're looking to use uh, you know, offshore shipping containers, which are mobile. You can move them if Everett Road does expand to three lanes or four lanes sidewalks we could adjust the the business as needed we can pull them back further off the road if the new high school did come through and y'all needed more space for roads um, what we're seeing is that it's very difficult to find land large enough to hold these large units and your average 30 to 40 foot storage unit has a two to three year wait list so it's in very high demand um, a lot of storage facilities don't have ones that size. It's, it's more profitable to have smaller units. But we're wanting larger units because that's what businesses go after. So businesses need you know, overflow for inventory. They need to store, you know, say if you're a medical facility, you need to store documents for a long period of time. And they're not going after small units. They're going after the large ones. And so that's why we've targeted uh, space a little over three acres to hold those. Um, Let's see. Um, I think it's a, a pretty quick synopsis of it. Now, do you have any questions? You know, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand the brick building you said. And yep. The, so the uh, average store facility is a large brick building or a large building nonetheless, and you can't really move those. Well, we're using shipping containers, so steel containers that can be painted to look brand new if they're not already and can be mobile, so we can move them Actually, like we said, if, you know, Ebert Road expands, if you put three or four lanes wide in the future as a high school comes in, we can pull those further back. No, I misunderstood. I thought you were talking about building a large building, but you're saying you're not going to have a building. Yes. We're, we're not going to have a, a permanent building. No, it's going to be as low impact as possible, um, gravel so that the entire area stays permeable. Um, we're not looking to put a, uh, even a bathroom out there. It's going to be 24-7 access, a coded gate, and... One thing that we really, you know, thought about was, you know, if somebody wanted this land for residential, they would have bought it in the last three years that it's been for sale. And this is one of the hottest real estate markets right now. And as a licensed real estate broker, I can tell you that it, the market is not slowing down. And this property has been for sale for three years and nobody's bought it as residential. So is your plan to allow containers that are already filled be transported in and out so in other words if I have a if I have a no okay mm -hmm. and then how how often do you anticipate moving containers in and out well um, I guess until Gary Roberts tells us we can't operate business anymore <laughs> really I mean it's we don't we don't see once we get them in there you know um, I mean paint them as often as needed to keep them fresh keep them appealing to the community you know, uh, but once they're there, no, we don't intend on moving them very frequently. Uh, and the thing about the, our business strategy, our business model, where businesses are your clients, typically, you know, those are long-term tenants. That's somebody that's going to rent that same storage unit for multiple years on end. You're not going to have the in and out of your average storage facility, which is already low traffic. 
and the but you, the container stays whether the tenant moves in or out. Correct. Off. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So there'll be you're using a, a container instead of a building. Correct. Yes, sir. Traditional story. Yep. You just line them up next to each other down in long rows. And uh, in, in essence, I guess yes, sir. So you know, put some spacing in between them so walk through, and maintain the property, but um, we're not looking to have them extremely dense. You know, I mean that's uh, going. We're going for curb appeal. You know, to businesses. These are. You know, your entrepreneurs, you know, your business owners, doctors, your lawyers, professionals, you know, I mean, the, even the city may need space to just hold just pure documents and paperwork that they don't have space for. There's no, there's no on-site property manager or on-site, I mean, like a self-storage facility might have a office. Um, that. Well, that's not the plan at this time. It's going to be a 24-7 uh, coded gate. Right. And so somebody, you know, if you needed access late at night, you could use it. Um, but your code is unique to you. So um, is it Clarence? Yes. So if, if code 1313 goes in, we know that Clarence came in or that Clarence gave his code to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, now, in the future, you know, we may look at doing something like that, but that's not the initial strategy. And I guess to piggyback off of that too, it's um, what we're marketing as a bargain. You know, it's it's affordable storage, which it's all supply and demand. You know, the other other places are full. You know, wait list in place. You can't find. You know, if you call around, I need a, a ten by twenty unit. I just bought a house in the area. We're looking to move. Well, call us back next month, or it's going to be you know way more than most people anticipate. You know. I mean, it's uh, the average uh, average 10 foot unit right now. It's maybe $100 a month. That's just for a 10 by 10 space. You know, a 20 footer could be $200 a month, and that's that's not how we're you know really marketing. We're, it's affordable. It's the lowest square. It's the lowest price per square footage in town because they're big. They're bigger units on average. What is the size of a container? I'm I don't even know what they are. So um, you can get them in different sizes, um, but that typical is going to be eight foot wide, eight and a half foot tall, 40 foot long. Okay. You can also get short ones that are 20 foot long. Okay. Now another strategy, you could in theory turn them sideways and divide them up, but that's kind of a, you know, that's not that is your standard. So, so you would have the empty containers there. You go out, someone fills them up, you can then bring them back and keep them on your yard, or do they normally go out and stay on the customer's place of business? So they would stay on our property uh, at Everett Road, okay. and um, the the client, the tenant, would have access to it um, freely to and from. So you're not moving the containers? Yeah. Correct. You, once you, they're there. <coughs> once, to, once they're there, they are there. Yeah, yeah I'm just saying you're taking the containers out. I mean, you can. Actually, if there's, yeah, there's not the. It's going to look like hot. a truck terminal. That's right. right. That's right. Yep, not going to be a truck terminal. Not going to be pods. Um, this is just the uh, the most economical way to offer big bargain storage, which is how we intend to name the company's big bargain storage. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Any other questions, the staff? Do, um, what type of buffering, this is for staff, what type of buffering would be required? Type 3 buffer yard adjacent to residential. Would there be any street yard requirements? If they had parking well? between the buildings and the street, yes. Okay. Um, I had a question for staff also. Is, is this use allowed um, where, where, where there's no permanent building? Well, I was going to say there are building code implications there. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a building code expert. Uh, they would have to talk to Dan. It's my understanding there was a draft ICC uh, International Code Council um, provision that I'm actually looking at right now, dated from uh, last fall, that talks about using storage containers as permanent um, storage facilities, and they have to be on permanent. Um, have to be on permanent foundations and footings are required. Um, there are there's some under under um, underfloor ventilation required um, between the bottom of the storage container and the earth. I mean, so there are some things that they would have to do. You couldn't just roll out there, put a put a shipping container on the ground, and call it good. They would have to meet building code. But there are provisions in the code that would deal with that. There had to be permanent anchoring and those kind of things. But um, 
it appears it could be done, but it, it's not just as simple as having gravel and going and putting the building, uh, going and putting the storage container down and calling it good. There, it would have to meet building code. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Mr. Lineback. Okay, thanks, sir. Is it okay that staff if he has anything to add? Yeah, we got some time. Anyone else like to speak in support of this? It's like four and a half minutes at this point. Okay. Do you have anything you'd like to add, Dan? I think you covered it pretty good. Okay. Low, low impact storage facility, no permanent structure. Um, okay. Well, I mean, if you want to speak again, or no, okay. All right. All right. Uh, does anyone anybody, else like to speak in support of this? Does anybody have any questions for us to sit down? We'll get to that in just a minute, sir. Okay. Okay. You in support? You like to speak in support of their? No. Okay. Then we'll turn to the opposition. You like to speak in opposition? And come forward and give us your name and address, please, sir. My name is Lee Haggy, uh, 4360 Ferris Road, and we live in a residential area and we want to keep it residential that's why we bought where we bought and uh i envision from what he's saying no <laughs> i envision from what he's saying a bunch of tractor and trailers stacked up like down on hickory tree road in 52 i'm sure y'all rode by them and seen them down there where old winn dixie used to be and that's that's where my mind goes with this i'm a businessman i appreciate he wants to make money and i know he says he's going to put it in a small area, but if business goes well, he'd be a fool not to expand it. And and expand it gets back into his backyard and almost to my backyard. And let me get to it. Hi, my name is Jorge Abrego. I live at 4340 Ferris Road. <clears throat> our main concern here is basically our water standard. We have we live on well, and our wells is a very shallow well. And that's the, for us is a huge concern. We bought a home. We bought a home away from everything, so we don't have to worry about contamination, anything like that. But now he's coming with that. That to me is, it it's more like a um, slap in the face when a businessman want to bring put as much trailers to to put them behind my backyard. Literally, that property sits right in the corner of my backyard. Not only that, when people will drive by, they're gonna spill gas. It's no telling what kind of information or product they're gonna put inside those trailers. We even stay telling you documents, but you and I know whatever goes inside this trailer, no one knows what's inside. It could be anything, liquid, whatever, it goes to the ground. We have, we have well get contaminated. Not my only well, but all the residents around the area could, could be contaminated as well. So this is why I say opposite. We shouldn't, we shouldn't allow him to um, have his business there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else like to speak? If not, then I'll declare the public hearing closed. Work session. Let me have it, ask Mr. Roberts. Sure. Uh, Mr. Roberts, the, the um, <clears throat> this limited on there and the one use of it, how much control is that on that property in terms of future use? Well, the, any any uh, additional use would have to go back through the rezoning process. But it doesn't it, I mean, there have been a whole lot of discussion about how he's going to set this up and whatnot, but it isn't a site plan. That's correct. Thank you. And so it isn't, it, it, we can't hold the, uh, the current owner to or future owners to the particular business model he has, right? right. So That's correct. what we're really talking about is turning the land into industrial zoning, not what his business model is or what he plans to do with with his storage units, right? Right. It, general business zoning, but that's correct. Yeah, it's just general business. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a, a limit? Is there, I'm, you know, and this is a, it's a new product. So is there, I mean, can you put 10,000 containers out there? Or is it? There's some spacing requirements as far as aisle width and storage services retail use conditions. So they would, so you're going to have a 40 foot setback off of those two residential property lines to the um, mm -hmm. east and to the south. You're going to have to account for that, and there's going to be a buffer yard placed in there. And then apart from that, I think it's a 20 or 21-foot 20, uh, spacing for drive aisles in between those storage buildings. And then you're going to have at least a 10-foot street yard along Ebert 
Um, and so once you kind of carve that out, that gives you your developable area in the in the middle of the site of what you're left with. But provided you meet those those setbacks and the use conditions, there's no there's no limit on the number of units you could put in there yeah. or the number of structures. Yeah. Do you meet the life safety property conservation? type of requirements you can stack on you can do whatever and build an so, stair. so to, to piggyback on George's question and yours yes the only restriction on this property is the use of storage services retail so provided you meet minimum UDO requirements and minimum building code requirements from here on out we're going to issue the permit mm -hmm. I mean because the next owner could come back Correct. without changing zoning and build a three-story unit or whatever provided they meet minimum UDO minimum building code yeah. yes meet building code yeah I mean, in, in my visit out there, I mean, this is a, it, 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 even though it's zone residential, it looks more agricultural to me in terms of very uh, um, low density um, area that I assume will be developed residentially at some point, with, especially with the schools going out there and with the large residential developments that have gone on down Derwick Road and things like that. Um, and I, I really was surprised that somebody was asking for something out of that um, more activity center that was already designated there, particularly as I, I think was mentioned in the uh, presentation, the whole area plan, the neighbors and everybody had sat down and looked at this and realized there was plenty of area to develop general business. There's no utilities at the site now. Will that change when the school comes in? Is there a bigger regional area development process? The that sewer, you the, the, the four sewer mains serves the schools now, and so I would imagine the future mm -hmm. high school could tap onto that. But as far as connections along the way, it's not really designed for that. And again, there's no public water in Everett either. Okay. Whether or not so that, that would change for the school, I, I couldn't speculate. Yeah. Okay. That's right. The suitability for a subdivision is low because of the sewer issues. I mean, you're not going to get you're not going to get eight units of attached on this site, mm -hmm. which is what which is close to it's directly across the street from what the uh, area plan calls for. And, okay. Right. Not, okay, not without combining with other tracks right. to the east and draining down towards similar. Darwick Road. Right. Okay. Any other discussion? We need a motion. Anyone care to make a motion? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion for denial. A second. Motion by Ms. Nong, a second by Mr. Luke for denial. Any discussion? Those in favor? Opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Kirk is getting set up. Um, I just want to kind of uh, get this set up for him. As you know, we uh, we had our discussion. Chad came and uh, briefed the board on the UDO clear code project at the work session on the 25th. Um, he presented his report, and afterwards um, there was discussion with the board about the next steps with respect to implementation. And so, subsequent to that planning board work session meeting, our staff got together. Um, put a lot of thought into the next steps for implementation and kind of where we go from here. And Kirk is going to uh, walk you through that process here to give you a little bit more uh, uh, detail on how we are going to do that. Thanks, Aaron. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Chairman and members of the planning board. Uh, again, as Aaron mentioned, we kind of just uh, met as a staff after the work session and got down to brass tacks and tried to figure out really the next three years or so of our work program how we're going to implement the recommendations of this code <coughs> assessment. So the first thing that we need to talk about is you all have received the report from Chad. You all decided that you, it sounds like uh, Ms. Dunnigan's <coughs> questions were the only remaining questions and Aaron did send his responses, Chad's responses out uh, last night. If it's deemed those are satisfactory and then there's no uh, future questions, we would like the board to formally endorse the assessment. And once that happens, then staff can start implementing it. So that's kind of the first thing that would need to take place, a very minor but important step. 
Uh, the next step in this process would be finalizing the UDO style set. And that's where we're going to be looking at the fonts, the colors, the page layout. We're going to be working with Chad Meadows on that as a staff uh, between now and the end of December. And once we get that in place, uh, Code Right Chad will also be presenting the code assessment as an informational item to both the City Council Committee and the County Commissioners at a briefing session in early 2019. So there's going to be a few different things happening simultaneously, and I'll get to a flowchart in a minute that will help you visualize that. Uh, this is just, again, a refresher of what the style set, what we're talking about when we use that terminology. It's really just the nuts and bolts of how the UDO is going to look in its new format. And so we're just going to, this is what we're starting with, but we're going to bounce it around staff and make sure we like the colors, the fonts, things of that nature. So the real big step that we're uh, fast approaching is moving the current UDO content into the new style set. Basically doing what Chad <coughs> mentioned, rearranging the existing chapter structure into something that's much more user friendly and intuitive, and uh, basically uh, taking that ordinance text, adding in new section numbers, new cross-reference numbers, things of that nature. But we're not going to be doing any actual ordinance provision massaging or changes during this step of the process. When we met uh, last week as a staff, we kind of kicked around, how are we going to accommodate this in the existing work program? This is going to be a very time consuming task. And we decided to throw it out there to see if Chad could accommodate this since we've been happy with the services he's provided thus far and he's demonstrated a thorough understanding of the code. He actually came back with a very reasonable estimate for how much he would charge us to do that and a very, uh, very fast timeline for doing that. So we've decided that we will contract with him to do that. The benefit that the board is going to reap from that is that we expect to have a reformatted UDO ready for the board to have a public hearing on by the spring. So I know, uh, Arnold, you mentioned, uh, Aaron, uh, after the meeting that the board wanted to have a very fast timeline if possible, just get this thing done. We're very pleased that that seems like something we're going to be able to deliver on. So uh, once we have that in place, then the elected bodies will hold public hearings on the reformatted UDO during uh, the summer of 19. Just to help you visualize this uh, in a little different way, this is a flow chart I put together. Uh, you can see where we are right now is on the left side, fall 18, planning board endorsing the assessment. Once that happens, there's going to be two paths that are going to be happening simultaneously. The first, as I mentioned, is the style set will be finalized, and then uh, we'll give Chad the green light to go ahead and prepare that reorganized UDO in the winter months of 19. Again, during the same time period, we're also <coughs> going to be bringing Chad back to present to a council committee and also to the commissioner's briefings. So those tracks can kind of dovetail together back in probably March or April to have a planning board hearing on this. So again, keeping a focus on moving forward as quickly as possible to reap the benefits of the code assessment. Also, just to refresh the board, when I was talking about reformatting uh, the existing UDO into Chad's uh, chapter structure, the image, uh, the left side of the image is what we have now with uh, four different ordinances, basically, the definitions ordinance, zoning ordinance, et cetera, and then several articles within those. He's proposing that we go ahead and just reorganize that into a 10-chapter structure with the most, most used provisions at the front and the least used provisions at the rear, such as the definition. So again, this is very much the state of the art and what other communities are using. Moving on to the next fiscal year, 2019 to 2020, staff will be working this summer in preparation for that year on preparing RFPs for two things. We've talked to you all about this before in the past, but just to uh, remind you, the first will be an online codification of the UDO in its revised format, and a second RFP for preparing a consistent set of graphics <coughs> in the UDO. Again, we have UDO graphics now that various staff members have done over the years, but they represent different style sets. They're also not as prevalent in the UDO as we would like to make it uh, most useful for our code users. Going back to the code, uh, code provider for a minute, again, we're going to be looking for someone who can offer modern functionality that our current Muni code layout is uh, absent of. We're looking for effective search functions, the ability to include hyperlinks both internal to the document and to external documents, 
and uh, vibrant graphics. And also the ability to seamlessly use uh, this document across different devices, such as laptops, PCs, and tablets and phones. Also, I want to point out, uh, some of you may be wondering, well, what's going to happen with codification when we get this new draft from Chad, but before we pick a new code provider? We've decided that we're going to codify in-house for those few months in what I would just call a dumb document, basically just a PDF. You could still search it using the PDF function, but it's not going to have the, the fancy hyperlinking or anything like that. But really, that's not anything we have with MuniCode right now, so it's not going to be a great loss. The reason we came up with that recommendation is we pay, I think, $12 per page of text right now to MuniCode when we do an update. So you can imagine $12 times over 1,000 pages. That's kind of a sunk cost that we wouldn't be getting back if we had MuniCode update that. Plus, they can take a long time to even do that. So we'll just self-codify for uh, less than a year. And uh, we're also going to be looking for a consultant who can prepare a consistent set of graphics like we talked about, but also has the ability and the time to be kept on a retainer for the future so we can continue that consistency in graphical styles future years down the road. And uh, we expect to have all those tasks completed by the end of next fiscal year. And Council and the Commissioners have already earmarked $40,000 for us to accommodate those tasks. Uh, just thinking uh, now the 2021 fiscal year and further beyond that, that's when we would start addressing what Chad presented to you last month as the gray areas. These would be things, uh, problems with the current specific provisions of the code that aren't necessarily substantive, but we can't say with a straight face they're non-substantive. Those would be things like removing obsolete provisions, for example, the building triangulation requirements for multifamily that everyone uses the alternative compliance provision of providing an elevation now, or things like the current sign ordinance and its uh, lack of content neutrality. That's something, an example of a legal statute that we need to get up with in the future. The last thing I want to leave you with is that we would recommend any substantive text amendments. Those are the things Chad's talking about with revising the tree ordinance to make it simpler to use or things of that nature. Not addressing those until we start our next comp plan. We want to make sure that there's any big changes that are going to be proposed, have community buy-in, have a significant form of discussion. And as we've mentioned to you guys before, we'll probably be looking at starting our next comp plan process in four or five years. So this would really put us in a good position to go ahead and have these things happen in parallel as part of that discussion. And once that comp plan is adopted, any of those text amendments that made the cut similar to the text amendments that made the cut in Legacy 2030, staff would move forward to implementing those after that plan was adopted. So that's kind of it in a nutshell for the next three plus years or so. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have at this time. Well, we get the answers to the couple questions. Were you satisfied with the response that you got, or are you still have some questions? Uh, I still have some questions, but I did have a further <clears throat> a question on what you just sure. said. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, when you're ask, you're talking about you're asking us to endorse the assessment, mm -hmm. and I really want to understand what that means because there are some substantive parts of this, the ones that will be done down the road, that he's made certain recommendations about, and some of those I think would require a lot of thought and discussion, and, yeah. and I wouldn't want that to be seen as a roadmap that we would necessarily have to follow. Yeah, so. When we asked for the endorsement, the, the idea was to make the UDO more user friendly, and this is the study that kind of gets us there. We're asking you to endorse that. We're not by any means taking the endorsement of this code assessment to say we're going to do every single thing in those, the, the long term, the gray area text amendments, because there's some things in there staff may not be interested in as well. So, no, we are not taking that as that we are going to do every single thing in there. Um, that is not what we're asking you for, but we are asking for your endorsement of of going with the code assessment and sort of the general layout that we're talking about from going from the old UDO to the new UDO and the process that we've that we've laid out for that. But no, we're not locking ourselves into every single thing in there. And, and again, just to kind of further Aaron's discussion point there, as I mentioned in the last point, anything that's really substantive, we're going to want to have a separate, robust public process just like we would do for any text amendment. 
we're trying to stay very true to what we told the board the intent of with this project was and anything beyond that even if it has merit it's going to have to be its own separate process so could we receive the report rather than endorse it i don't know whether that gives you the i don't know i mean i, I understand your concern and i, I kind of share it I, mean, I think we all understand right now what you mean by endorse and i guess we've got you know a, a record of what was said about what we mean by endorsing it but I understand the concern about saying we endorse this when it's got some substantive changes we might not all. How about receive and concur with Kirk's steps for everything except for 2021, everything prior to that? Yeah, that we're, the process, the blood chart. And the, yeah, I'm, I'm good with the process. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's essentially what we're asking you for. That's it. And also we're going to, every year when uh, Margaret prepares the work program for you, we'll talk about each of these kind of steps I've laid out for the next three years as they relate to each of those successive work programs at that time. Yeah, I think it's going to be worth our time to take all those things that he suggested and consider them. That doesn't mean we're going to Absolutely. adopt them or endorse them, but, but we'd be foolish not to at least uh, examine them. Mm -hmm. I'm good with that language. Receive. Could you put the style set back up there? Sure. Sure. So, there's an awful lot of who <laughs> on there. I know Mr. King's not responsible for that. Mr. Murphy, uh, <laughs> I was recommending that's the color. Steve, the color that Steve Smotherman actually got a hold of this. Uh, yeah, that's I, Panther color. Okay, I can go. I can go. Fair enough. Okay. Needs to be a little bit lighter for Mr. Murphy, but we'll get some uh, some purple on there for Mr. King. Too. There's a lot of black and gold up here today. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, I'm not seeing very much gold. I'm pretty yeah. happy. But before going forward with doing that, let's let's address those questions. If we, yeah. Next, please. Yes. Um, the question one about quasi-judicial decisions, um, I think there was a, a misunderstanding about what I was asking for. Yeah. Because what he did here in his answer is basically just restate what he uh, told us at the meeting. Yeah. And um, my question was really, what are the substantive issues, you know, that would be affected by this? And, and uh, you know, I, I was really just asking because I, in order to, uh, to evaluate the impact of this, I would like to know what some of those things are. The one that comes to mind is cell towers. I know that cell towers is decided as a special use permit with a quasi-judicial, but do, do you offhand have, have a list of... of so, so if I understand your question, what you're asking for is really what uh, specific uses in the UDO would be affected? Yeah, the, where the city council or the county commission decides on, on a special use permit with a quasi-judicial process. I think Chris is pulling that up right now. Yeah, and actually I'm, I had it up and then I shut it down because I think I need to go to Municode again. So, but uh, you're right, yeah. cell towers, yeah. asphalt plants, um, homeless shelters, yeah, not, um, access that. easements that um, go through a property that's not zoned for the use you're accessing through, um, institutional parking and a, an expansion of institutional parking and residential zoning, um, and there's probably a handful of others. We have one next month for a quarry and extractive industry in Jihai. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and um, just as we think about this in the future, I think you know it'd be a good idea to talk to the, the decision, the elected bodies, to see how they feel about giving up that decision-making process. And, 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 you know, before we, I, I agree, I don't, I think the elected officials would have a hard time delegating a lot of those really, really intense, heavy SUPs down to the Board of Adjustment. What I could see them doing is perhaps doing what we just did with TROSA, where we, um, you know, we, that's the first time we've done that in a permitted use table where we allow use, but it has to be through special use zoning so that the elected officials would still have the authority on that, but it would allow for public input. Um, so that may be an option for them to consider in doing that. That may kind of give them the flexibility to still approve mm -hmm. or deny, but also get public comment. Uh, well, that's a good clarification to make between the special use permit versus special use zoning. Right. And sometimes that may not be clear in terms of which process we're going to do or which right. one we're addressing. And I did talk to Chad on the phone yesterday about this, and that's what he was his, his response is kind of long-winded in there, but what he was saying to me is basically he wants to keep the people 
the elected officials in this case out of trouble for acting in a way they're not set up to act in that they're usually acting legislatively they can approve something up or down for whatever reason they feel and the one time they're having to act in a quasi judicial setting like a judge it kind of is hard for them to tell their citizens I can't listen to you about this and there's other paths forward like Aaron talked about with the first amendment yeah, and it's a, it's a mixed bag, and I'll you know I'll just give you a couple of, a couple other examples. Entertainment facility large, if it's not in E, um, that's in the HB, the GB, and the CB zoning districts. Uh, the use kennel indoor in the LO district. Um, the use storage services retail in the PB district. Is that correct? PB or LB? I think it's PB. Yeah. Um, the I don't see any E's on that page. Um, the an, a public animal shelter in the institutional public zoning district, uh, IP. Um, the use correctional institution in HB, GB, CB, and CI. Uh, the use... Uh, 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 land clearing and inert debris or L LCID landfill less than two acres in the county in AG, RS-40, RS-30, and RS-20. Uh, this is an excellent example of what he's trying. Right, exactly. <laughs> sanitary, sanitary landfill anywhere, even in GI, that's the only use, that's, uh, that's the only place sanitary landfill is allowed. Anywhere a homeless shelter is proposed, um, the... Um, Transmission towers in um, the residential districts, um, parking offsite for multifamily institutional uses in the parking, uh, excuse me, in the residential districts, and Aaron's already mentioned the access easement private offsite. Those are all the E's that are in the table. He's trying to keep our elected officials out of jail. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, the other question was about the um, non-conforming, and um, I have to say I was a little. It, this is a little unclear to me exactly what he's proposing. I mean, is is he proposing that all um, one option would be for all non-conforming um, issues to go away to the point where they would be all permanently grandfathered? That's an option that's on the table. In talking with him yesterday, he had several different options that he laid out about uh, lessening staff's need for nonconformity tracking. That's really what was the genesis behind this is, you know, we, get, we have the one-time expansion of up to 25%, and uh, we have some of the other provisions in the UDO. You can, of course, go from a more intense nonconforming use to a less intense nonconforming use. We'll let you do that. But he was just trying to, again, not dictate that we do this, but explore options to maybe reduce some of staff's time in that endeavor because he's trying to, one of the things that he said he was trying to do was make more efficient use of staff's time in relation to what he called the 80-20 rule to you guys last month. And if staff is spending 80% of its time working on a real small problem, maybe uh, reduce that number to more like 20% of the time working on that small problem. But again, we haven't even talked about that specific recommendation as a staff and if we would even want to consider that. Yeah, I just wanted clarification on what he was saying. Um, so um, under this scenario, if there was a lapse in use, would that be permanent? It would be permanently grandfathered to the point where even lapses of use would not be tracked, or would they be? So I haven't even read the provision. I don't even. I'm not even exactly sure what's being discussed as far as specifically related to that. Um, currently, one of the. I mean, one of the issues that we really have with nonconforming. Uh, the whole purpose behind nonconforming uses is they are eventually supposed to go away. The way we kind of treat them with the ability to change the uses um, kind of perpetuates keeping the use around and one of the problems that we have is the date for nonconforming use in the county is 1967 and the date for nonconforming use in the city is 1968. 
Well, there aren't very many people left that can go back and tell you if something was there in 1967 through the affidavit process. So, you know, that's one. As we continue, we're you know we're 50 years down the road, 51 in the case of the county from the date of nonconformity. So it's a problem when we're trying to establish whether or not something has is legally nonconforming or not if we don't have a file on it. Um, again, I haven't looked at the provision, but I think that. If I remember some of the discussions we had with Chad from a couple of months ago, I think you know one of the things he was saying is you know again the, the whole purpose behind non-conforming uses is to eventually get rid of them. They either come in and rezone, or they go away and they become conforming to the district. So, um, well, I would um, also add that part the part of the policy behind non-conformity, the way we treat it is is uses that have been established for 50 years or 75 years and the neighborhood has encroached on they you know subdivisions have sprouted up or whatever the case may be and there's still you know some some property rights to protect uh, with using a property the way it's been used for 75 years so i wouldn't say just carte blanche that the purpose of the uh, <laughs> those sections of the udo are to do away with non-conforming uses do away, do away one of two ways. Either they close or become formalized through a rezoning process. Right, right. And that's one of the things he suggested is move to a by, by right type of designation that allows certain things like 25% increases um, in use or, or, or size or something like that. And so, you know, I, I would be very supportive of something like that. And, and you know, you you may not be. Yeah, that probably would that not be. That's problematic. But the, the other thing is I see it as protective in a way to have um, allow nonconformities when, when you go forward with new rule changes that are going to beef up the standards for mm -hmm. something. You know, for example, with the, um, the, the stormwater ponds, we have these nonconforming stormwater ponds that are permanently nonconforming. And that's a, a potential safety health issue for our community. So we should be thinking carefully about this. And, and again, this is a great example of value added uh, Chad editorializing that is above and beyond what we originally hired him for. And as such, it'll be kind of examined at a later date when we look at some of those other more substantive right. provisions. I, I think, I think the, the point to, to staff is there may be some better ways to administer. I mean, there's, it, it's, that's a very murky part of the ordinance when we start getting into nonconformities and did an expansion occur? What counts as an expansion? I know we dealt with this with Marywood Christian Camp, an outdoor campground. So they added some ball fields. Is that an expansion? It's not a building expansion. I mean, I know those are some of the scenarios that staff deals with. It's very murky when you start messing with that. To Melinda's point, there are some nonconformities, uh, nonconforming properties around town that are that are very um, prominent and will definitely be on folks' radar as far as when we start tinkering with nonconforming. If we go that route, that we would have to be mindful of. Um, I think Staley's on Renolda Road is is one that that jumps to my mind and there are probably several others that have some community impact so again I think Kirk's point's right that's something to consider but there's definitely room for improvement what that improvement is it's, it's definitely down the road in the in the latter phases of this if we decide to tackle that and that's something that we would definitely want a lot of community involvement in if we chose to go that route and just one other perspective on the quasi judicial uh, situation I would love to see almost all of our stuff be quasi-judicial. I think it removes us from that mob rule, stand up if you support this, you know, kind of that heated kind of uh, element to a lot of our decisions. So, you know, there are some of us who would prefer uh, to have a more, you know, um, uh, quasi-judicial. I understand it's You're glutton for punishment. Well, <laughs> I'm, just, you know, I'm just letting you know there's another opinion out there. <clears throat> Uh, I, I had one other question, and it, that's the very end of his answer about the um, amortization provisions for um, 1985 through 1989 and 2012. He's, uh, is he saying that these are totally outdated? Is there any reason to keep them? In? What, He's what, what saying are they? that the amortization period has already expired, so in his mind there's no value in keeping them in the ordinance anymore. I think the only argument for leaving them in there is maybe as a historical record that if someone came with a certain use and a neighbor might try to throw an enforcement complaint against it, 
we could use that to say, well, there's this provision in the ordinance. We'll look it up to see if they came into compliance or not. For it reference just keeps purposes. that in the public record. But his point is well taken that those periods have come and gone. Yeah. So the thing should either be gone or in the cases of like the rooming and boarding houses thing, it should be on the registry. I guess, we, did we end up doing that, Chris, with the... Community development did, yeah. but you know they, they they worked closely with our staff. But they actually ran the registration period and amortization for the boarding and rooming house changes. So that's what he was talking about in that last bit of the memo. Yeah, if the amortization periods have run, you know, if the ten year chunk of time is ten years ago when that ended, I mean, that makes all the sense in the world. Just get rid of that language. There's no, I don't. Yeah, as long as there's a way to protect enforcement of any outstanding issues. And even that, that's something that going back to the last slide here, I would see that happening in 2021 plus. You could argue that's a gray area because it's not really adding any new provisions, but it's still taking out a piece of the code that someone might look for one day and wonder what happened to it. And I really, I like his, his concept of <clears throat> draft this thing such that we're not spending a hundred thousand hours on of inspections department time you know if, if we don't want to do something you know if it's going to require a hundred hours of inspection then just as a policy maybe it's not worth doing it you either just turn it down or you or you figure out uh, that you can live with a certain amount but these times you know 7 30 11 30 all this kind of stuff it's impossible to uh, adequately staff inspections to enforce those things so I would wholeheartedly agree with getting rid of some of that does it serve your purpose if we receive the report endorse the process uh, and the proposed format but stop short of saying that we yes. accept the, yes. the recommendation yes that we will consider or we appreciate his recommendations but Okay. I think everybody's got to understand those are going to have to be vetted kind of down the road on a case-by-case -case basis where, where, again, we're not locking into everything in the document in that back end. So, yes, what you suggested is, is acceptable to staff. Okay. Okay. We need a motion. Yeah, we do. All right. Well, I, I move that we recommend approval of the undertaking itself and the process that's been outlined to us thus far. Um, and I think that's – I can stop talking right there. I believe that's. Mm -hmm. Do you want the format or not? And the, we're going to tweak that about? format. I mean, I think that's just an example. We're going to tweak that some. So again, just really the process and the time, the, the strategy that Kirk has laid out for you, yeah. the, in the okay. slides there. Okay. So a second. A second. Second, Mr. Leak. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you. They can work on the colors. <laughs> yeah, dark and the blue. <laughs> blue devils, right? Okay. And uh, burgundy. We're still on staff report. Yep, just a few quick items for your December meeting. Um, we'll have three special use uh, rezonings to bring to you and three PBRs. And we'll have the two continued cases, the Medline case on Wahlberg Road, and then ARF will be coming back uh, as well. Uh, City Council approved East End Master Plan this week, and they also uh, approved, you remember we did the GMA-1 expansion amendment uh, that was kind of a companion piece to East End. They also approved that. Both of those were unanimous. And on the same agenda, we have a new local historic landmark at 200 North Stratford. That's the Womble House, I think was the correct title. So that's if you're heading north on Stratford, five points. It's on the left-hand side, kind of across from Runny Mead, that area. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, just another meeting, Peters Creek Corridor plan I mentioned to you, November 15th, that's 6 to 7.30 at the Georgia, Georgia Taylor Rec Center. We'll be starting that process. So that's all I have under staff report. Okay. One comment I'd make is that this time of year for Thanksgiving coming up, I just want to say I'm thankful for the staff and what you do for Absolutely. us. We appreciate yep. you and I appreciate yep. my fellow board members. Uh, Ms. Smith? A motion to adjourn. <laughs> We're all in favor? Uh, We're adjourned. Okay. Oh, man.